the epistle to the Hebrews. We're reading from uh, the chapter 11 and the chapter 12, at page 254 in the Bible that you found in front of the pew in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 12, and we're reading from verse 32 on to the third verse in chapter 12. The 11th chapter of Hebrews, and we're commencing our reading now at verse 32. We all read together on the Lord's Day morning, taking your time from me, please. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, wax valiant in fight, turn to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging, came moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawed asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dams and caves of the earth. These all, having obtained a good report, through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed above with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. God will stamp his word read this morning with his own divine approval from his own infallible book. Hebrews chapter 11 and Hebrews chapter 12 are two portions of Scripture that are well worth returning to again and again. But the first two verses of Hebrews 12 are one of the texts of the Bible to which God's people return to and often ponder and think upon. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us 
And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I was struck recently when I returned to this portion of Scripture in my personal Bible reading to see that there are seven things here that we could shout, should consider as we come to find the sweetness and the blessing of this text, which as Christians we should return to again and again and again. Notice, first of all, the encouragers that are all around us. The text starts with, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. The cloud of witnesses, of course, is all the people referred to in chapter 11. What a great company! of God's people are set down here. A, cry, a cloud of witnesses. They are a cloud of witnesses to what God has done for them. They are a cloud of witnesses of what God is doing for his people. And they are a cloud of witnesses for our encouragement and exhortation in our Christian life, our Christian service, and our Christian activity. A, crowd, a cloud of witnesses. A crowd of battlers, a crowd of consecrated believers, a crowd of saints, a crowd of patriarchs and priests and prophets, a crowd of the greatest encouragement that the people of God ever had. Men and women of fear. What giants, what conquerors are listed in that brief chapter? It commences with the elders who had a good report. And it lists all those who went the second mile for God. And as you are down in the arena of life, facing the battles, the difficulties, the opposition, the temptations, the darkness, the disappointment, and the distresses of time, God has set around you a great cloud of witnesses. My, if you think of that crowd and think of what they endured for Christ, our life is a paradise compared to their life. Our battle is as nothing compared to the strife 
in which they engage. Our occupation for Christ is simple and pleasant compared to the fires they pass through. The burdens that they bore, the disappointments that they suffered, the strain that was put upon them, and they're all around us today. The encouragers around us. You go down through that chapter this afternoon, take time to go through it. And ask yourself as you read every name. What was that man's special place in the history of the church? What was that woman's special place in the history of the church? And you'll discover something, that each one mentioned had a special, peculiar trial. But in that trial, they conquered and they prevailed. So we have the encouragers around us. Secondly, there is to be an execution required within us. There is something that is to be executed in our hearts. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Why are we not like the children of God in chapter 11? Because we're cumbered with weights that tie us down to the affairs of this life. God's people should live above the world and its sinning. But God's people today are living in the world and its sinning. And they become spotted by this evil world in which we live. These weights Hold us back. They hold us back from looking on Jesus and they hold us back from running the race that we should be running for Jesus Christ. Look at these men. How did they all run the race? He allowed no weight or no sin to beset him. How did he not run the race? He allowed no weight or sin to beset him. How did Noah run the race? He allowed no weight or sin to beset him. How did Abraham run the race? He allowed no weight or sin to beset him. How did Isaac run the race? He allowed no weight or sin to beset him. How did Jacob run the race? He allowed no weight or sin to beset him. There's an execution has to take place within our heart. The weights have to be executed and removed. The sins that do so easily beset us are to be executed and removed. We're to be like Samuel, who when they brought the king Agag before him, Samuel took the sword and slaughtered him completely. There has to be a slaughter in our hearts. We need to declare 
unceasing war against these winds that tie us down, that tie us back, that keep us from doing the job of work we should be doing for the Lord's sake. Yes, there is an execution required within us. We need to come and we need to have that slaughter of the wits and that slaughter of the sins that do so easily beset us. The expanse before us, the race that is set before us. God has set the race ground for you. You do not set the place where you have to run. You do not choose the place you have to run. It's not of your picking, of your choosing. God has planned it for you. God has set up its hedges. God has set up its path. God has laid its foundation and God has pointed with his finger and says, Run now! Remember, you have not to run outside the hedgerows. You have to run within them. You have not to run on someone else's path. You have to run on your own path. You are not to run in the place you want to run but you are to run in the place God Almighty says you have to run. There are so many Christians today think that they can do another Christian's running. I've heard young preachers say, if I was only minister of that church, what a great preacher I would be. Well, you'll never be a minister of that church. You'll only be the minister of the church that God has appointed you to be. God has a place for you. It is the duty of every child of God to discover the expanse that is before him. Time is short. The enemies of the Christian are great and powerful. The temptations are terrifying. The opposition is of the fiercest. The people of God are not to surrender. They're to fight. They're not to bow themselves to the enemy. They are to break the enemy. This expanse must be faced and conquered. So run that ye may obtain. That is the challenge of the exhortation, exhortation to us in Christian service. Let it resound in our ears this morning. So run that ye may obtain. Are you running to obtain? Are you running for the first place? Are you prepared to lag behind and not care where you come in in the race? Dear child of God, this is surely a text we need to be always returning to. What an expanse is before us. What work needs to be done? What prayers need to be prayed? What souls need to be saved? What evangelism needs to be accomplished? What are we doing? Idling away our time when the colossal task and expanse is before us. 
And then there is the exhortation given us. Look what it says. It tells us here that we have to run the race. We have to run the race. This is a hard race. This is a difficult race. This is a long race. This is a lifetime race. There is no discharge from the running. The race is set. It's decreed of God. There's no alteration. There's no changes. The rough places have to be conquered, not shunned. The crooked places have to be straightened, not forgotten. Every wall must be leaped. Every difficulty must be faced. Every enemy must be destroyed in Jesus' name. There's a hard part to every day's running. At times there's smoothness and there's joy. But every day there's a hard patch. Are you going to let that hard, hard patch beat you and punish you and destroy your love in serving Jesus Christ? Run the race! Do not run the race if you're entangled with the affairs of this life. You'll not run the race if the first thing is not God's priority. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all other things shall be added unto you. Notice that the race is to be run with patience. The Bible says, let patience have her perfect work. There is one thing that the children of God need. There is one thing that every child of God needs. It is a renewed baptism of patience. So often Christians tire. I look back on a long ministry in this road and the experiences of Christians who got tired, who grew weary, who said, I've done my bit. No, you haven't. You'll never do your bit until God calls you home. You have neither the starting of this journey and this race in your hand or the end of it. Christ has marked the starting point and Christ has marked the ending point. You have absolutely no say in what lies between those two points and nor can you change those points. They're not in your changing or in your sovereignty or in your authority. And you are called to have untiring patience. You are called upon to have unfeeling patience. You are called upon to have unflinching patience. To set yourself that task, I would say to you, in all your getting, get patience. It's easy to be impatient. It's easy to be weary and well-doing. It's able, it's easy to listen to some Christian 
to tell you you'll wear yourself out. I never met anybody yet that was worn out for God. No man prayed more than George Mueller to feed his orphans. And at the age of 70, George Mueller retired. He gave up his orphanages. He gave up his work in Bristol to do what? To retire, no. To have an evangelistic campaign round the whole world. A man of 70 setting out on an evangelistic campaign round the whole world. And during the next 20 years, George Miller was a worldwide known evangelist. Mr. Spurgeon, who suffered a lot of ill health, was in Menton and South France, and he says, the youthful George Miller called in with me today. He's heading on to the 90s. But he's busy evangelizing the whole world from country to country. Many people have heard of George Mueller and his great work with the orphans. Few have heard of George Mueller, the great international evangelist, and the work that God mightily did. I'm reminded of one strange happening when he started off in his ministry. His first campaign was to be in Canada. But when the boat reached Canada, the great river was covered with mist. And he went up to see the captain. And the captain said to him, Mr. Mueller, this mist will last for ten days. And we will not land in your place where you're going for your mission. Ten days. Mr. Mueller said, I'm sorry, Captain, I'm arriving on time. The captain said, do you know what you're talking about? He said, yes, I do. Do you see that, Miss Captain? My father made it. My father will remove it. So the captain said to him, I don't believe it. But if you want to pray, I'll kneel down with you. No, he says, you'll not kneel down with me. You're an unbeliever. God doesn't hear unbelievers. You'll not dare bow your knee, an unbeliever. I'm going to kneel down. As I believe. And he knelt down. And he prayed. A very simple prayer. In fact, it was said the most simple part of George Miller's Christian experience was the way he prayed. And he said, Lord, I'm your servant. I'm starting these evangelistic meetings. I have to be on time. You must be served by somebody who is on time to do your work. I'm not a loafer, I'm a laborer. Please take away this mist. And he got up, and the captain smiled, and he says, Is that at all? No, no, he says, that's not at all. He says, Would you step over to the door of the wheat house? And he stepped over to the door, he says, Just open the door. He says, Do you see any mist? No, he says, There's no mist. I can see for at least 50 miles ahead, the mist had gone. There was a man who knew how to run with patience the race that was set before him. God is a miracle God, but he only does miracles for those who believe that he is a miracle God. Do you believe him? If you believed him, you would not tire. 
Notice also the example before us. Looking unto Jesus. Ah, uh, here we have the secret. Get our eyes off ourselves. Get our eyes off others. Don't listen to what they say. The greatest discouragers in the world are the people of God. Don't listen to them. Carry with your earplugs. And when a child of God tries to discourage you, take the cotton wool of the earplug out and put it in very strongly. Don't listen. Listen to God. Looking unto Jesus. My Savior never tired. I have meat to eat ye know not of. He was wearied in body, but he was alert in soul as he led the woman at the well to the place of forgiveness and peace through the Savior's blood. Yes, looking unto Jesus steadfastly, looking unto Jesus strongly, but doing something more, looking unto Jesus strongly, because when you look to Jesus, you get song in your heart even praise unto God. Oh, for a church of people who will be looking unto Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Here we have the excellency inspiring us. Christ started the course. Christ Start it well, the course. You can start the course, and you can start it well. How? By looking unto Jesus. Christ finished the course. Christ finished the course well. You can finish the course how? You can finish it well by looking unto Jesus. You've got to run. You've got to run and run and run to win. This is a great work. It's a work of goodness. It's a work of load carrying. It's a work, work of stickability. It is the thought on partnership. We are yoked into the plough. We have our work to do and we must do it well. We must pull our weight and take the portion of the work that is our task and discharge it with great seriousness and great consecration. This is the way that God wants us to do his work. He wants us to consider the encouragers around us. He wants us to carry out an execution within us. He wants to glue us to the expanse that is before us. He wants us to heed the exhortation given to us of running the race. He wants to have an expectation from us that we run the race with patience. He wants us to follow the example before us, looking unto Jesus. And he wants us to consider the excellency that will always inspire us, the one who is the author and finisher of our faith. I trust that today we will humble, humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God.
that he may exalt us in due time. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank thee for the solid word of God. Write its truth, its exhortation upon our hearts, and grant that the words of our lips and the meditation of our hearts will be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. And the people of God said, Amen.